Hello and welcome to our podcast on the definitive rules of comma usage. Let's go ahead and dive right in here. All right, so the most common usage of the comma comes when we have items in a series. And so when we say series, we mean that there is a group of three or more in a grouping. So for example, Johnny went to the store and bought milk, bread, and butter. He bought three things, milk, bread, and butter. And so between those three items, we need to have commas. So we have one after milk. We also have one after bread. And so some people will say that the comma after the second item and before the and is optional, and it is. We would definitely argue that you put it in there just for clarity and so that you don't have to think about it. So if you just get in the habit of putting it there, you will always do it correctly. You can see in the next sentence that we can also be separating verb phrases. So perhaps Sally went to the library, checked out a book, and began reading it. We have three things that she did. They are items in a series. We need commas in between all of them. Just as a side note, if you have watched our podcast on parallel structure, you know that when we have things that are multiple, we like to see them in parallel form so that we should make sure that all three items or four or five or whatever are in parallel format. So all verb phrases or all nouns or all in infinitive forms. We just want to make sure that those items in a series are parallel. Another use of the comma is in what we call appositives. And these are nouns or noun phrases that rename the noun that comes right before it. For example, Johnny, the kid with the red hair, is first in line. The kid with the red hair is an appositive. It gives further description of the noun that comes right before it, which is Johnny. And since it is non-essential, meaning we don't have to have it in our sentence for the sentence to grammatically make sense, and it could be removed, then we can go ahead and put commas around that. Because we could just say Johnny is first in line. But if we want to further describe Johnny with the appositive of the kid with the red hair, then we need to go ahead and put that in, but we put commas around it. Another important use of the comma is what we call parenthetical expressions or interrupters. And these are basically items that interrupt the writer's train of thought. So oftentimes when we are speaking verbally, we throw in transitions, we throw in our thoughts, we throw in little side comments. When we transition those verbal things to writing, we often call them parenthetical expressions because they are interrupting the flow of the sentence. For example, Stephanie's decision, in my opinion, was not in her best interest. Again, in my opinion is not necessary for the completion of the sentence. It does interrupt the flow of the sentence, and therefore it would get commas around it because it is a parenthetical expression and an interrupter. Another example, the new park, of course, is a popular tourist destination. And so since the phrase, of course, interrupts, it does need to have commas placed around that. Another use of the comma is after introductory elements. So when we have elements that are stuck on at the beginning of our sentence, before the main sentence, then we need to go ahead and put a comma after them. And so these could be interjections, which are expressions of emotion. These could be clauses. These are groups of words that act as a unit and have a subject and a verb. Or if we're going to go ahead and use a phrase, those all need to have a comma after them. For example, wow. That was a great answer. If we want wow to be attached to that was a great answer, then we go, need to go ahead and use a comma after it. If we wanted to make wow a more strong interjection, then it would be wow, exclamation point, and then a new sentence, that was a great answer. But since we're joining them, it becomes wow, comma. Next one, although he was tall, comma, he was quite coordinated. And there we have an introductory clause. And then the last example, in the past, comma, Frankie has done a tremendous job. And so here we have an introductory phrase. So when we have material that is introducing our sentence, it needs to be followed by a comma. One more use here is what we call for compound adjectives. And these are adjectives that are used to equally describe the same noun. One way to test whether a comma is needed in this particular structure is if the word and could be placed where the comma is and it still makes sense. For example, 
when you're on your hike, watch out for the lean red fox. Both lean and red equally describe fox because you're saying it is a lean fox and it is also a red fox. And if you restated it using and where the comma would be, it would still make sense. Watch out for the lean and red fox. Another example there, we walked along the long, dusty road toward the farm. But we do need to be careful when we're talking about compound adjectives. We need to watch out for any adverbs that might be describing one of the adjectives rather than the noun. And we also don't, don't want to separate age adjectives. For example, Johnny is a very tall young man. Very describes tall here. So it's not that he's a very man, it's that he's very tall. So very tall is one unit of adjective. And then we have young. Young does describe man. What kind of man? Young man. But it would seem very weird if we were to say he is a very tall and young man. We could, and in that case we might want to put a comma between tall and young. But otherwise, we can go ahead and just leave it as is. Johnny is a very tall young man. There's no need to separate tall from young. So just be careful that you're not separating adverbs from adjectives from their nouns. So just be careful on that. One of the biggest issues students have with comma usage is in the arena of avoiding run-on sentences. This is a big one. We'll spend a lot of time talking about this in class and a lot of time practicing this, but if you can grasp this concept on, on your own, even better. So here's the rule. We need to use a comma with a coordinating conjunction to separate two complete sentences, which in grammar speak are also called independent clauses, meaning they can stand on their own. A coordinating conjunction is a word, a conjunction, that connects two items that are coordinate, or in other words, of equal importance. And there are only seven of these in English. And the acronym we like to use is FANBOYS, F-A-N, B-O-Y-S, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. So these are your coordinating conjunctions. So go ahead and look at the bottom example there. Jenny sings in the choir, and she plays the guitar in a band. Jenny sings in the choir is a complete sentence. It could stand on its own. She plays the guitar in a band is also a complete sentence. It could stand on its own. Now, for whatever stylistic reason, if you want to combine those, then you need to use both a comma and one of these conjunctions. You can't just use the conjunction. You can't just use the comma. You need to have both of them together. And so I would guess you're also saying, well, wait a second. Jenny sings in the choir and she plays the guitar in a band. She, in the second half, is the same as Jenny. And you're right. She is. But grammatically, since it is a restatement of that subject, it counts as a new subject. Therefore, we have a complete sentence to the left, and we have a complete sentence to the right, and so we need to have a comma and a conjunction in the middle. Pretty important stuff, avoiding those run-ons and making your sentences a lot more clear. Here's some other examples. Amanda enjoys her job, but she is looking forward to her vacation. Again, complete sentence on the left and on the right, but we need to use that comma and the conjunction. So we see Amanda enjoys her job, comma, but she is looking forward to her vacation. The comma and the conjunction are necessary there. Here's one more. I will either study mathematics or I will study chemistry. And so even though I is stated in both halves of this, it is a restatement Therefore, it counts as a new subject. Therefore, it counts as a new sentence. And if we're going to combine them, we need to use both the comma and the conjunction. The biggest issue students have is that they either put the comma or the conjunction. And we can't. We need both of them. It's just one of those rules you got to get down. So this one's kind of difficult, but it's something that we will, we will mention. The commas help us avoid misplaced modifiers. And so the comma allows for the sentence to be read a little bit more clearly when it could be read in two different confusing ways. For example, when John went to Hollywood, on a whim, he decided to become a ninja movie star. And so the way it's written, 
It implies that he went to Hollywood with a plan. But then there's a comma that separates going to Hollywood from on a whim. Therefore, it implies that he then, just out of the blue, on a whim, just for the heck of it, decided to become a movie star. Now, maybe that's exactly what you mean, that going to Hollywood was the plan, and then just some random Tuesday afternoon, he said, I'm going to become a ninja movie star. Maybe that's exactly what you mean. Perhaps you meant this second sentence. When John went to Hollywood on a whim, he decided to become a ninja movie star. This slightly changes it. This implies that he went to Hollywood on the whim, and then he made a plan to become a ninja. So you have to ask yourself as writer, what exactly do I mean? And then we need to group items that are all of the same train of thought together and separate them wisely with our comma so that we don't have any potentially confusing moments. So on this slide, we're asking you to take a moment to practice and to place the commas correctly based on the rules we've given you previously. So go ahead and pause the podcast and see if you can place them correctly. The answers for these are on the next slide. Here's one more set of four sentences for a little bit of practice. Go ahead and pause again and see if you can place the commas in the right place. So that's about it for us. We have about five, six, seven rules here that are pretty essential for us to know in terms of commas. Please make sure you know these. And if you don't, please go back and review this podcast as many times as it takes to get them down. Just because we now know the uses of the comma does not give us the right to just throw commas out willy nilly whenever we want in our papers. There are rules. There are structures that call for them. We must follow those rules and do them correctly so that our writing is more clear and so that our reader can figure out what we're trying to say. So as always, if you have any questions, please go ahead and bring those into class and we will see you soon. Thanks a lot.